like to thank also the Friends of Imperial College uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about what we've been doing recently. Um, just going to share my screen uh, in terms of uh, addressing the pandemic. Um, so a lot of the work uh, that we've been doing over the last few years has really been focused on addressing uh, infectious diseases. Uh, from a technological perspective, you know, my lab is looking to try and create the next generation rapid diagnostics that could rapidly identify whether somebody's infected. And I'll be showcasing uh, that technology and telling you some of our, our latest efforts in, in addressing the pandemic of COVID-19. What has been introduced, I'm, I'm not a life scientist or a medic, I'm an engineer, and my background is in microchip technology. So I'll be speaking a bit about the technology as well that's uh, actually powering our, our rapid diagnostic. But to begin my talk, as Bill mentioned, you know, it would be great to have a time machine, uh, but until that time, this is the world we currently live in. I mean, there's a new pandemic of the coronavirus, and it's impacted us all because it, we've seen it's a deadly virus. It's got a large transmissibility. I mean, it spreads uh, very, very rapidly. And it's also something that's, uh, you know, made this all reflect, I think, in that, you know, we've all needed to stay at home and self-isolate. And that's put a huge burden both on the economy, economy but also uh, there's a huge mental burden as well in, in kind of dealing with the, the issues of self-isolation. Um, so there's a huge need now to address this pandemic. I mean, the UK has put a very, very ambitious target, um, which is we think quite well, that we need to rapidly test people. They, they've set a target of 200,000 tests per day. And that, that makes sense because, as you can see from this map here, if, if we can rapidly test and screen at scale, then we can very, very quickly identify hotspots of infection and then we can uh, contain them with different policies. You know, as, as we saw recently with, with Leicester, for example, that they asked the, the, the whole town to shut down. And we've all been in this situation here. You know, we've woken up in the morning and we've had slightly runny nose. We've looked at the, the thermometer and we've said, have I got COVID-19? What do I do? And, you know, it could be COVID-19, could be just the flu. It could be hay fever. Who knows? So my vision has always been, you know, wouldn't it be great that if we had a small handheld device, which was, you know, very nice and easy to use, similar to this device that I was using when I was growing up around the 90s, where in the palm of your hand, you could quickly plug in a cartridge, give it a sample, and it could tell you exactly what your infection was. And I'm hoping to convince you through my talk that this, this vision that I'm portraying here isn't science fiction. It's actually something that we've, we've brought very close to reality. I mean, the implications you could imagine would be huge because when waking up, you'd be able to rapidly test. And you know, if in this day and age, if it's not COVID, you can go back to work, go on with your, with your daily routine in life. And this is going to be enabled by this technology that uh, I've spent most of my academic life uh, designing. So we use microchips. And the microchips that we use for our biomedical systems are exactly the same microchips that you'll find powering your mobile phone and any consumer electronic device. And we use these microchips to create full systems on chips, meaning we integrate thousands of sensors to analyze a sample, and we create what's called a lab on a chip device. So we take the functionality of a big lab and we miniaturize it down to this small chip for analysis of a sample using sensors which are based on field effect transistors. And my lab within Imperial, you know, fundamentally uses the microchip to create next generation medical devices, which are meeting the challenges we're currently facing in healthcare. Bill talked about my uh, earlier work in designing a fully closed loop system, an artificial system to replace the pancreas and treat diabetes. We also make things which sit on the body and in real time can relay vital sign information to a phone, for example. And today's talk is going to focus on diagnostics, where I talk about integrating thousands of sensors on a chip 
and I create a lab on a chip device where you give it a sample, which could be a, a fluid with something that you want to interrogate. And the chip at the point of care can, can diagnose that sample. But a huge effort of my lab in, in the last few years has also been to try and deploy technologies where there's a huge need, and that's in the low middle income countries. Because we've seen through the outbreaks of things like malaria and dengue that these, these countries, they don't have access to big community hospitals with dedicated, sophisticated labs and an abundance of resources. Therefore, you know, when we're designing our technologies, we, we keep this in mind. And I'm going to show you several programs where we've actually been able to address these needs and deploy tech, the, tech, the diagnostic technology for addressing um, outbreaks of infection in developing countries. Because, you know, through my experience, you can design the world's best technology in a lab, but it, if it hasn't got any use in the real world, then it's not going to have any impact. Unfortunately, uh, for me as an engineer, I mean, the, in terms of diagnostics, uh, the World Health Organization, which we all know now with, with uh, with the COVID pandemic, you know, who sets, who sets guidance, uh, they've given us a specification sheet to design for in terms of rapid diagnostic tests, which to me as an engineer, this is music to my ears because in, in engineering, it's all about designing to specs. And in terms of a rapid diagnostic test, you can see the criteria here. It should be affordable, obviously, so it's mass deployable and cheap, less than 10 pounds per test. It should be sensitive so that it can detect very, very low copies of a pathogen in the sample. It should be specific so that it, could, it tells you exactly what you're looking for. I alluded to user friendliness, you know, so that minimal training is, re is, is, uh, is, is needed. And it needs to be rapid, you know, diagnosed in under two hours, I've set at the target here. You'll see with our, our, our um, COVID diagnostic, you know, we've set a target of under 20 minutes. It needs to be robust so it has longevity, equipment free, and obviously deliverable to the end users. And if we look at the current diagnostic techniques uh, for COVID-19 and general for any, any, any infectious disease, you know, you'll, you'll take a sample. In this case, it's a nasal or nasal pharyngeal swab and you'll send it off to a lab. And that can take anywhere between a few days to, to weeks. Obviously it needs dedicated expertise and sophisticated labs, which is quite, quite expensive and resource, uh, resource uh, uh, intensive. And it also depends on the use, skilled users to use the equipment. However, you know, with the dedicated lab, despite the time, you're dedicated, you're guaranteed to get the correct result because the tests will they're extremely sensitive and quantitative. On the other side of the spectrum, you know, we've heard a lot about these, the rapid diagnostic tests, the so-called antibody tests, uh, which obviously they are quite rapid because you give a drop of blood in it's based on a lateral flow device, so it gives you your, your answer. Don't need any expertise it's affordable and portable however it tells you only if you've had the infection not if you're infectious so in terms of containment of spread these these uh, uh, aren't suited for purpose and also we've got no guarantees we well, studies haven't significantly shown yet whether or not you know you generate immunity based on the antibody response and also these are very qualitative they're not quantitative also we've seen some of in some of our studies in relation to malaria where we use a lot of rapid diagnostic tests they're not always 100% uh, correct. So they're very, very prone to a lot of false negatives. By far the gold standard techniques, we know are the molecular methods, the so-called PCR tests, because you know, they use this, this very expensive piece of equipment in the lab. You can get very, very high sensitivity and specificity. And it's very, very quantitative as well. So it tells you exactly how much pathogen you have in the sample. However, it can take time, you know, greater than two hours in terms of analysis. So it's, the average is about two to four. It requires dedicated expertise through, you can see a skilled professional. It's very expensive, you know, but this, this piece of equipment costs about 50,000 pounds and it needs a lab. I think by far the best diagnostic should combine the best of both these worlds. So have the simplicity and affordability of a rapid diagnostic test, yet the sophistication of a, a molecular PCR test. And I'm gonna show you how we're achieving that with, with microchip technology. Because microchips are suitable for these types of tests because they've been proven to be able to detect DNA and RNA in the absence of the need for fluorophores, light. You know, so you don't need bulky optics similar to conventional instruments, so you can make a lab-free instrument. Also, because on the microchip, we're not just putting the sensors, we're also putting the instrumentation, which means we can achieve 
instrumentation and, and sensing with incredibly low limits of noise, which means we can get incredibly low limits of detection, which all, also enhance our, our ability to do quantification. Because we can integrate thousands of sensors, you know, we can do create uh, panels of markers on a chip and do multiplexing. And also we've proven in the past that we can get reliable detection of DNA using what are called ion sensitive field effect transistors. They're similar to the, the MOSFET transistor I showed you in the first slide, yet we turn them into pH sensors and using our amplification chemistry, we detect the presence or the absence of DNA. And here's an example of our flagship chip that we're using for infectious diseases. We call it Titanix because it was designed by two of my PhD students and now Nick Moser, who's a postdoc, who'll be showing the lab, uh, designed this chip. It's got 4,000 sensors, you can see them here. And what's unique about this chip is, again, we've also used microelectronic circuits to make it adaptive. So we know with any sensor that it, in terms of robustness and reliability, it needs to be able to compensate and adapt to its environment. And this chip has the capability to be self-adapting to its environment. As a result, we can get very, very robust and reliable results when we interrogate samples. And here's an example of the output of one of our chips. I mean, you can see this here is a video which is showing the output from a thousand sensors from this, this is an earlier prototype. And whoever I show this video to, they are, tell me, okay, that's the output of a CMOS camera, an image. And I say, no, this is actually the output of a thousand pH sensors, thousand chemical sensors showing an amplification in real time. So for the first time, you know, we can introduce the concepts of things like ion imaging, where we get real time spatial temporal information of chemical reactions happening on the surface of our chips. And we couple that with novel amplification methods. Anybody who knows about PCR knows that it needs to thermocycle between different temperatures. If we're looking towards developing a handheld prototype, the easiest thing is to keep things at one temperature. So we've developed an isothermal molecular method, which it can amplify DNA in the presence of uh, nucleotides and one temperature, so we use 63 degrees, with a very high, very high sensitivity and specificity. The amplification chemistry is called LAMP, loop-mediated amplification. And the principle is if you've got a target that you're looking for, and that target can be a DNA fragment or an RNA for a virus, for example, we design a primer, which you can think of as a probe, which goes and it binds to that, that target because DNA is very complementary. You know, a, a target will bind to its probe in a complementary fashion. And then in the presence of nucleotides and enzymes, in this case, DNA polymerase, there's a chain extension and a byproduct of that is the release of protons. And those protons are detected by the sensors that we've designed. So you can imagine if your sample is confirmed positive, that is you have this target, you'll get protons in a change in pH, which we detect. If it's negative, you won't get a change in pH. And that's the basis of the technology, how it works. We do uh, something unconventional. You can see in that we put basically liquid on electronics. So it uses uh, basically sophisticated methods, as I show you in terms of microfluidics and 3D printing, to encapsulate our microchips. It sits on a PCB on the top, we put the molecular biology. And on the bottom, we have the electronics with the pH microchip sensor and a platform for connectivity. And as I mentioned, our target has always been low middle income countries. So we aim to make this as cheap as possible. And I'm pleased to say that it is incredibly cheap because again, we're leveraging everything that's been done in the consumer electronics in industry. We're using microchips, which uh, you know, we're using the same manufacturing facilities that are making, for example, the, the chips which are used in the iPhone. We use standard printed circuit board technology, which is used in every electronic device. And we use 3D printing to make really low cost scalable microfluidics that allows us to deposit our sample. And our current test price, I mean, the, the, the cost to manufacture this cartridge is, is 11 pounds for a thousand, but seven of those pounds is actually in the assembly, not the, the bit of materials. So as we scale to, to develop millions of these things, I, I imagine this cost will go down significantly. And if you compare it with, you know, a standard test, which is used, uh, for example, for a molecular PCR in the NHS, it, at the moment it costs them about 60 pounds per sample. Uh, we do 11 pounds per test, but also we can multiplex several samples. So we've just demonstrated, you know, that we can put, uh, do a nine plex in terms of antimicrobial resistance on our chip. So 
again, we can really divide down the costs and make them affordable for different, different healthcare settings. And we take this cartridge and here's our handheld device, which we call LaceRoom. So our cartridge plugs into our handheld device and I'll show you a video of it functioning in a second, but this is actually the, the first handheld molecular diagnostic, which is able to interrogate a sample and amplify uh, DNA and RNA in real time. And what's unique about the, the uh, device is that it can detect the target in under 30 minutes. In real time, at the moment of detection, we geotag the result, upload it to a mobile phone, and that goes up to our cloud server. And in real time, we map where the infection has taken place. I mean, we were doing this before COVID, and I'll show you some of our results in our trials in Ghana for malaria. But you can see how this model is now relevant for real-time surveillance, because in real time, we're getting exactly where the infections are happening. And this lends itself very nicely to testing, you know, out in the community, in schools, you know, in, in, in airports and, and different settings to do to rapid diagnostic and screening of, of infectious diseases. I've, and if you look at our target product profile, you know, comparing it obviously with lateral flow tests and real time instruments, we're not as cheap as a antibody tests, but I've highlighted earlier the advantages compared to the antibody tests in that, you know, we've got sophistication of a PCR and that we're quantitative as well. We can tell you the pathogen in the sample and tell you that you're infected. And also we do the real time surveillance and we can also do prediction in terms of uh, using that surveillance information to predict outbreaks. In terms of our test, you know, we're, we're not far off. Obviously, if we, if we include two more, more panels, we'll, we'll get cheap, as cheap as a lateral flow. But, you know, we're, we're as sophisticated as the lab-based instrument, so we're still a lot cheaper than the molecular-based PCR that's, that's currently run in the lab. You know, so I think it's still a huge potential. And as we scale the test, you know, you, you can see the price getting down to the, I think, the five, five pound mark. And here's a video of, of our handheld molecular diagnostic. You can see it's a similar form factor to, to a phone. This is our COVID-19 edition, which we've just launched. Uh, so you take off the cap, you, you can see the different cartridges now there. We've used 3D printing to make our microfluidics. You plug it in, you then pair it to the mobile phone. And here you're gonna see an output of the 4,000 sensors. And then in real time, you deposit the sample and we've got a two compartment chamber here where we give the sample and our, our control so that we can absolutely with 100% certainty tell you that the sample that you're interrogating is indeed infected with the SARS-CoV-2, which is a COVID-19 virus. And then you get the output in real time on your phone, which is then uploaded uh, to the cloud for surveillance. And before COVID, you know, we're working on a variety of infectious diseases. We first started off with the big challenge of antimicrobial resistance. We know that antibiotics are going to stop working soon because um, there's huge resistance to antibiotics due to the misuse of antibiotics in, the, in different hospitals and healthcare settings. So there's an urgent need to identify the, the resistance genes in terms of bacterial infection and therefore you can give the right antibiotic to treat the infection and drive down antimicrobial resistance. And we showed, you know, in our first head-to-head -head comparison with the big instrument that, you know, we've got similar performance in terms of graphs and we detected this enterobacteria's resistant genes in under seven minutes. So that was our first confirmation that we could, we could indeed, you know, have equivalent performance to a molecular test and we're also a lot quicker. Seven minutes, you can begin to see separation of the positive and the negative control. We went on to look at other types of uh, bacterial infections. So you can see like, Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's a very common one in terms of antimicrobial resistance. And I'm, and I'm showing you this, not just to highlight the speed, but also to show that we're quantitative. So we can tell you exactly how many copies of uh, bacterial viral infection you have in the sample. That's what's related here in terms of our copies per reaction. And that's, that's beneficial because you can then begin to see like, for example, the stage of infection, the virus and the severity, you know, how far it's spread in, 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 terms of the, in terms of its host. And obviously if you have more copies of pathogen, you know, similarly, you know, when you begin to present samples, you might have 10 to the three, you know, more copies also leads to kind of a faster detection time. So even, even at the lowest copies, you know, 10 copies per sample of, of uh, bacterial uh, genomic material, we're still detecting in under 10 minutes, you know, with good separation. And why we could repurpose rapidly for COVID? Well, uh, we believed we could do so because back in November, we did a similar exercise at addressing, you know, an, an outbreak in terms of um, 
collision resistance within the NHS. I mean, a new resistance strain called MCR9 was, was detected uh, back in November. And then within three weeks, we repurposed our diagnostic to detect this resistance strain. And we published that, that result very, very rapidly in, in Nature Scientific Reports. And you can see here again with, with colistin resistance, you know, we were able to get very, very reliable time to positives in under 10 minutes. You know, here the average is just below seven. We've been extracted pet samples from, provided from our collaborators as part of the NIHR funded Health Protection Research Unit in Antimicrobial Resistance uh, run by Professor Alison Holmes in um, Hammersmith Hospital. And we know we're not just working on antimicrobial resistance. As I mentioned, a big target has been the low middle income countries and we've done a lot of work in malaria. And also not just detecting, you know, whether somebody's infected with malaria in different species, but also looking at drug resistance to malaria. And here we showed, you know, we could detect artemisinin resistance, uh, again, with on-chip quantification very, very, very rapidly, uh, with very, very low time to positives uh, using, using extracted samples. And, and we know with these results, you know, we were fortunately funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund and the team you can see here went down to, to, to Ghana last year, last summer, to also show that the platform was mobile and did a live test uh, with malaria samples, also showing on-chip quantification and rapid detection of malaria in under 15 minutes. And we were actually gearing up for a second phase validation. So um, this summer we were set to go back there where we're going to load the diagnostic in the boot of a car and do live detection of malaria in schools in rural Ghana. Obviously, all that's been put on hold because of the pandemic, but it's something we're, we're looking to, to do in the future, uh, hopefully next year, uh, when, when, as we you know, plan ahead. But we've proven it on a number of pathogens to date. You know, we've got a big program also in dengue with Vietnam and Thailand and Taiwan, also locally looking at aspergillus, and also using things like what's called the host response with Professor Mike Levin's group in St. Mary's, where we can do a simple test, which gives a simple answer whether or not you're infected. Infection is a virus or a bacteria. You know, it's a simple answer, but the impact could be huge because you know, for example, whether or not to give antibiotics. And it's, it's a global collaboration. I mean, we're launching in several countries. We're also looking at uh, tuberculosis in, in uh, South Africa with, in collaboration with Red Cross Children's Hospital. As I mentioned, Thailand, Taiwan, and Vietnam have been looking at dengue. Ghana, now the Gambia, we're also looking at malaria. And also within Europe, we've been fortunately funded by, by the Diamonds Consortium to look at, uh, again, using the host response and multi-class signature. In addition to look at looking at you know infections in animals here within the UK and plus some work done by BBSRC. So we were doing all this work and then COVID happened. So when, as soon as COVID happened, we thought, you know, we need to do our part uh, as a lab. So even though, you know, Imperial uh, in terms of the South Ken campus went, went in, into lockdown, we were fortunate to get, get approval to, to stay open, you know, and do our part to, to help with the pandemic. You know, credit has to go to my amazing team, which, you know, work, worked uh, around the clock, even during the, the peak of the pandemic, to repurpose our diagnostic. You know, we, we had the objective I and mean, we saw what's out there. We, we, we spoke with our, with our collaborators as well as to how we could we'd create impact. And we came to the view that we need to develop a point of care test that's deployable in the community, similar to what we would have planned for, for malaria and other infectious diseases. But, you know, we set a, a, an ambitious target. We wanted to detect if you're infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus in 20 minutes. And I'm pleased to report that uh, we achieved that goal. Uh, so through our first phase validation, we were receiving samples uh, through, again, the, the collaboration with the NHR Health Protection Unit and uh, Professor Ellison Holmes groups uh, from Charing Cross Hospital. Uh, and we did an evaluation of amplification chemistries, and we showed on 200 samples that we could rapidly detect uh, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA virus. In under 20 minutes, our average time to positives, I say 20 minutes there, our under time, the time to positives was around 13 minutes. We were at a very, very low limit of detection. Uh, with 50 samples tested on the device, we showed reliable detection with the, with very, very clear, you know, separation in terms of our positives and negatives. So we're very, very pleased with that results. And I'll, I'll also show you what our plans are for next phase. But just to highlight the advantages of, of our diagnostic and being rapid and sensitive, I mean, there's this nice graph published by JAMA. We, we know that it shows you the, your symptom onset in terms of when you've been infected with uh, COVID-19. And we know that when you're infected, you know, here's antibodies, you generate antibodies and then they can tail off. Uh, and obviously you're less infective here, but you're, you're highly infective here when symptoms are high. And you actually begin to develop 
uh, symptoms or you, you've, you've actually got, you know, SARS-CoV-2 RNA in, in, your, in, in your body, even before you're symptomatic. So I'm hoping with, you know, advanced sensitivity, we'll also be able to pick up cases which are positive in COVID just before they find symptoms and therefore, you know, we'll additionally be able to help with the spread, prevent the spread. So we have delivered, uh, in terms of our, our search, the first molecular diagnostic, which can run in the palm of your hand, and it can diagnose DNA and RNA in under 20 minutes. It's sensitive, specific, and quantitative. It works with a mobile platform and geotags the result real-time surveillance. It's lab-free, low cost, and it's scalable as well, because we're using conventional consumer electronics. You know, Scaling these to thousands of devices actually uh, I'm not going to say it's an easy exercise, but the, the manufacturing capability is there to allow it. And, you know, we've also proven in, in two occasions, it's adaptable to new pathogens, for, you know, within a month. So for, for, you know, the, I'm hoping there isn't new outbreaks, but, you know, in case that there are, you know, we're, we're prepared for that. And I'm also pleased to report that, you know, we've received uh, funding from Imperial COVID Research Excellent Fund. Um, and the objective of that fund now is to scale the technology. So we're, we're scaling to a thousand tests per month to you know, meet the demands of, you know, the, that the, the government has set. But also the plan is to do live testing in Charing Cross Hospital where we benchmark against standard microbiology up, up to a thousand tests of, of COVID-19 patients. Moving forward, we're looking to our multiple model of doing community testing and also you know, working with our limited income partners country partners to do deployment and also looking at syndromic monitoring. So I've also got some techn wearable technologies as well, looking at the uh, monitoring of progression of uh, people's health with COVID-19 and you know, doing prediction as to whether or not they'll necessitate uh, admission to intensive care. And here's an example of our dashboard, you know, so that the Diagnostic as soon as it detects, it uploads to our dashboard, and then you can really, really detailed postcode information as to where the outbreaks are happening. With, you know, we're, we're also bolting on. You know, we've got lots of machine learning analytics and AI and decision support systems which can fuse this data and do additional predictions. And all of this, you know, is is uh, tools which we're building into our model as we move towards as, as our lab in a boot idea where we are going to use the uh, uh, the diagnostic in the community. So on that note, you know, I'd like to come back to my original vision, you know, which was our handheld device. And I hope I've shown you that we're not far off. And they're actually very, very close. We've proven we can have a handheld molecular test with several cartridges, which can identify different infections. And, you know, I, I, I put this slide here, you know, I was showing the demonstration of an early prototype at the Imperial Festival. You know, the key to the success of technology has been co-designed with the end users, you know, we're working with our clinical teams and our uh, friends at Imperial and epidemiologists to show that, you know, the device is very, very usable and therefore we're, we are confident that it will have success when, when we deploy it. On that note, you know, I'm very passionate about technology and innovation and I've really, really, really enjoyed, you know, working in this field, being able to realize my intent things that you know I can imagine and we're also with the team as well with great ideas and as, as Albert Einstein says you never failed until you until you stop trying you know and as a team we're really excited and we've we, we will continue to try and, and, and basically change the landscape in terms of diagnostics for infectious disease and on that note you know I want to thank the great team in infection technology also all my collaborators you know both in, in the clinical side conscious for COVID-19 and infectious diseases and all my funders, you know, that have supported me throughout this this journey as well, and continue to support me, support me as well uh, in in the diagnostic landscape. And also thanking you all for for listening to my talk today. Uh, and uh, uh, we can open up to questions, but before we do so, um, I'm going to pass over to Bill, who's also going to go to the lab so that we can show you a, a live demonstration of of the team working in the lab and the technology and the facilities that we're using for. Um, our rapid diagnostics. So, so thank you very much for listening to my talk. And on that note, we'll pass over to Nick. Okay, thank, thanks, Pantelis. Uh, John, could we just unmute Nick? Yes, yes. Uh... Okay, Nick, 
Great. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. That's perfect. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, first of all, before I start, I just wanted to introduce you to part of the team that we've got with us today and to emphasize how uh, multidisciplinary the team is. So I'm originally an electronic engineer like Pantelis. We've got Luca here, who is Hello. a molecular scientist who's worked on developing the assay. And we've got Chiara, Hi, who's a bioengineer and who's been working on microfluidics for the platform as well. So Pantelis has shown you the device. This is how it looks like. So the lace ring device, as you can see, is very handheld and is based on a cartridge, which is single use. And it's here in the middle of the device. If I show you the cartridge slightly closer, you'll find the Titanic chip in the middle, along with a manifold, which um, has a role of microfluidics and was printed using 3D printing. I'll take you to the 3D printer in a minute, because like I said, we're currently in the lab where we run all the COVID validation. I just want to show you that when we've got the lace ring device running, we pair it onto um, a mobile phone, which uh, where we designed the custom app where we can directly see the signal from all the sensors and process the data to give a result on whether the patient is affected by COVID or not. And once we've got that flagged, we synchronize it onto a server and we're able to um, map it onto a real-time map where you can see, for instance, on the UK, you've got some, uh, you know, potentially some starts of epidemic starting over here and a bit more cases that have been detected in London around Imperial during our tests. If I take my computer now and show you a bit around, um, I guess I can start with the molecular side. And one thing that's interesting to note is the way the NHS is currently doing is using diagnostic laboratories, which would have um, big instruments like this one. This is the real-time PCR instrument, which um, has a cost of around 20 to 30,000 pounds. And this is the state of the art for detecting. It uses optical methods, it's quite bulky. And this is what we're trying to, in a sense, replace directly in the field with lacing. Now, if I take you to the mechanical side of the lab this is where we've got the 3d printer so the 3d printer over here is has really been a key enabler for the test that we've run recently because it's allowed us to have several iterations of a design of microfluidics um, in a day so we've gone through like tens of iterations to get to the current prototype that we have and very quickly we can tune in something change the design print many manifolds in one go with 3D printer. And with this, we combine the molecular biology, the microchip, and the 3D printing. I think um, that's gonna be it for the laptop for now. So just like Pantali said, if you have any more questions, please feel free and we'll be very happy to answer them. So I'm happy to take uh, some, some questions. I see that people have written some in the chat. Um, so somebody is asking if uh, does the a new pathogen require a new chip or are the chips configurable with software so when we're, we're detecting you know infectious diseases we make a disposable uh, cartridge obviously that's because of the nature of the test you know if, if it wasn't infectious you know we could clean the cartridge and just reuse it in the lab uh, which we can do for other samples, you know, which aren't dealing with infectious disease, but for the, the, the purpose of infectious diseases, yes, it's, it's one cartridge, which is disposable, which, but which is also why we're making it incredibly cheap. Second is about, is NHR collaborating with the NIH in the US, uh, the Tissues on Chips project? I mean, that's not something I can answer, but what I can say is that our, our center, you know, has been fortunately funded by the, by the NHS looking at testing tuberculosis in children with Red Cross Children's Hospital in Cape Town. Somebody is asking, the time to result is very dependent on sample preparation. I agree. What platform was being used for RNA extraction at Charing Cross to validate your process and how will this correlate with your own simpler sample preparation method? How are you inactivating samples unless the samples put directly into a sample tube with an activation buffer? Is the virus S? So I agree with you, and you've actually said what we've been doing. So we've put it, been putting this swab in an activation tube with an activation buffer, and then that's uh, been through a protocol that the RNA has been extracted and being delivered to us uh, when, it's, when it's not infectious. In, in terms of our method, we're replicating that process. 
And we've got in the pipeline, which we're going to be validating a sample to result system from a swab. Uh, again, it's a low cost frugal solution using 3D printing, uh, which will give us extract RNA in under 10 minutes. So if you take that result plus our time to positive, which is on average around 30 minutes, you know, our target is still sample to result in under half an hour. There's a, a question about scale up and commercialization and people are offering their services. I'd say many thanks, please do send me an email uh, because at the moment we are working also with Imperial Enterprise and looking at scale up and deployment for, for the next wave of COVID. Uh, somebody's complimenting my presentation, thank you. Uh, would you uh, share to us how you could maintain the yield of the device cartridge knowing that some analog circuits are inside. So in terms of yield, as, as I mentioned, um, the chips that we're using for this, you know, aren't chips that have been designed recently. I mean, it's building on the foundation of almost a decade's research in ISFET technology that we've been doing in the lab. And as I mentioned, the chip, you know, we've got some novelty there in that it can auto calibrate itself and it can actually calibrate out any non-idealities due to the electronics. And we've been doing that because we know that, you know, again, we're doing something unconventional in that we're putting fluids on electronics and we guarantee that the electronics is 100% uh, accurate. And also in terms of our sensors, they all have exactly the same sensitivity and can adapt to changing environments such as temperature. Would you explain which is more difficult when developing new detection device? Is it the lamp chemistry synthesis procedure or the device test cartridge itself? Ooh. So in terms of diffidence and electronics have their own challenges and they require a joint multidisciplinary effort. So in answering this question, my, 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 my advice is look, in, look at a systems perspective and co-design because you'll see that if you design things independently, when you put them together, it might yield an inefficient solution or, or you know, you'll find challenges that you didn't address previously. We're fortunate you know, within our center to have you know, a multidisciplinary team. And yet again, we co-design both the molecular, the clinical and the electronics together, which has been proven to be useful. And I guess it's also a key ingredient in our capability to rapidly respond to any new emerging infection. In, is the same, In, somebody is asking in the same as the DNA nudge system currently being used under NMHRA U6. Somebody's asking, will every foreign citizen be able to purchase it? Will the chip be installed on mobiles? So in terms of purchasing, again, as I said, we're currently working with Imperial Enterprise about scale up and deployment. Uh, uh, and it's something we'll be able to advise more in the future. Somebody's asking about our slides. I mean, uh, the uh, the presentations will be on will be on uh, YouTube, as as Bill said earlier, and I'm I'm happy to share a slide deck if anybody in, if anybody requires it. If people wish to verbally ask a question, can we put your hand up? Yes, please, by all means. As as I'm, and we've got one last question before I guess we can put hands up and receive uh, questions from from the audience. Is the solution scalable compared to automated QPRCR systems, which in fact cost close to four pounds per sample? For example, Chang Cross Hospital needs to increase capacity of 3,000 samples a day. So again, uh, positioning the technology, you know, we're not a benchtop instrument where you can send it uh, a thousand samples and analyze them in parallel. You know, that was never our intention. Where we are positioning our device is in the point of care scenario, you know, something which is mobile you can, that you can send out and within half an hour it can tell you whether or not you're infected with SARS-CoV-2. SARS However, has having said... John, do you just want to allow people to unmute and uh, we can take questions uh, uh, from anybody that'd like to, uh, to do so? Yes, I think people can unmute themselves. Okay. Um, but uh, let me just go through. Let's see. Hello, yeah, there we go. People can now unmute themselves. Okay, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please just unmute yourself and if you wish to turn on your video. Oh, uh, so 
Can I ask a question, Pantelis? Um, is that the whole of that plastic block? It gets thrown away. However, as I mentioned, it gets thrown away because, you know, the, the ethics in place in the protocol, you know, mm -hmm. necessitate that. But, you know, if, if we were doing, ex, you know, just experiments and validation in the lab using pH buffers, and, you know, we've got other projects where we're looking at investigations of mixtures of ions, which aren't infectious agents or infectious diseases, we can easily ultrasonicate the chips, clean them and reuse them because it is a robust technology. We got a question. Well, Ross, you've just turned your video on. From the ISS. So it's it's a decadal study with the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And the vision is to use UAVs or some telecommunications satellite near space to look at feature detections like malaria swarms or something far out 30 years hence so um what's his background i don't i don't really have a question uh, tissue on chips is with nih temporal investigation and interrogation of tissue and cell samples uh, in real time and we're using that to get uh, Additional information, and I mean, there's two, two objectives. One is, you know, to, to have diagnostic capability of, of cells, but also looking at the way the cells uh, respond as we challenge them with different environments. Very, very fascinating. And I appreciate all the info. Um, yeah, and, and especially with tuberculosis. So that was my background. So thank you, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for listening to us. We've, we've got a hand up from uh, from Peter Michael. So Peter, do you want to? <laughs> yes, so, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, stunning, absolutely amazing. Thank I think we much. saw some of the background to this when we had a, a tour a year or two back and it was, uh, yeah. and I think you're, did I read you're using three and a half micron technology? Was that what I read? We, we were then, now we're using more advanced technologies. In, in, so in a, I, showed, I showed the, the chip with the 4,000 sensors. Uh, that, that's actually been the flagship chip, but obviously from a technological perspective, we have evolved and we're gonna launch a new chip soon. It's coming, it doesn't have 4,000 sensors, it's got over 30,000 sensors. And what that's gonna allow us to do is increase our multiplex capability. So in addition to COVID-19, you know, we've just received other awards as well to look at a range of respiratory pathogens. So on a single test cartridge with a sample, we'll be able to tell if somebody has SARS-CoV-2 or if they have influenza or if they have neither of the two, for example, which again, in, in terms of diagnosing infectious disease, we think will be incredibly powerful and have huge utility within our, within our hospitals. So we've watched Micron technology give way to nanotechnology and the ability to put billions of things onto yep. chips. Now, how does that affect your future? What does it give you better amplification, better specificity, sensitivity, and so on? Can you, if you were to have a, a nano, few nanometer chips and put a billion so, sensors so, onto it, does it, yeah. does the fluid dynamics get in the way of that? So I, I, the answer to that has two parts. I mean, the first part is that you're right in that microelectronic technology is actually scaling uh, to be smaller than what's physically possible with microfluidics. So you have to imagine that on top of our chip, we've got compartments. In each of those compartments, we look for a specific infection. Uh, to get a sample into that compartment, it's a fluid dynamics problem. Obviously, if the compartment's very small, you're not going to have fluid channeling to the compartment. Nevertheless, we've proven that we can have compartments down to about 20 microns. And in terms of CMOS technology, you know, the current state of the art is at seven nanometers. So if you divide the two, then you can see that within each compartment, we have... Uh, not quite a toddler, a baby verging on a toddler. I'm sure you have yes. better things to do. Uh, then uh, 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 continue.